hello guys i hope you are fine uh wherever you are in this uh video i'm going to uh introduce you our module uh in which i will be explaining uh the purpose of this module as well as to check on one or two uh issues related to the topic of this week uh that is the business political and legal system uh legal systems okay now the objectives of this uh lecture are that by the end of the week students should be able to appreciate the paper uh aka law global purpose syllabus and exam structure explain the interrelationship of economic and political and legal systems explain the, the doctrine of the separation of powers and its impact on the legal system explain the distinction between criminal and civil law explain uh, i mean outline the operation of uh, the following legal systems that is common law civil law sharia law now the paper uh corporate governance and business law global uh is uh examined in two sections all right uh that is section a and section b section a has got uh 25 uh by two mark objective test questions that gives 50 percent as well as 20 by one mark objective test questions objective test questions uh simply mean that you are only going to be given options or choices but only one of the choices is going to be the answer okay so you just have to pick one uh best answer from the choices given then there's a section b where we have got five by six mark mount task questions all right so these give a total of 30 percent but uh, all in all the pass mark is just 50 percent for all aka papers now this paper is a skills level paper its aim is to develop knowledge and skills in the understanding of the general legal framework within which international business takes place and of specific legal areas relating to business recognizing the need to seek further specialist legal advice when necessary so the paper is only going to give you some fundamentals however when you are now going to venture into the real business issues the um there is also need or consideration uh to be made uh on uh higher, or on seeking further legal advice you need to consult your legal practitioners uh when you want to uh, actually venture into the real uh, world of business it is advised it is advised that you need to consider seeking legal help however the paper is going to give you the fundamentals of your the legal tenets okay in the global world which means it is going to prepare you to be legally first now the syllabus main capabilities uh, are given in the notes and you need to refer to that part of uh, the notes okay we're not going to delve much on that now the concept of global law law is a global concept it is the enforceable body of rules that govern any society so enforceable body which means um these are rules which can be enforced all right which means when you break them you are bound to be a criminal okay or you are bound to expose yourself to litigation or lawsuits all right so uh law is a global concept uh, uh that is 
um, globally law is something that is recognized to exist okay um there is what is called positive positive law or national law which is the body of law imposed by the state all right so if you're an ACA student preparing for this law global paper you need to appreciate what positive law is and then there is a um what is called conflict of laws conflict of laws occurs when people from different legal jurisdictions trade with each other and their respective legal rules conflict on the other hand international law is the system of law regulating the interrelationship of sovereign states and their rights and duties with regard to one another so uh the conf conflict of law uh concept uh is something that can be examined in this paper and you need to appreciate it it is when people from different legal jurisdictions trade with each other and their respective legal rules conflict what is what might be uh acceptable in one one jurisdiction might not be acceptable in another okay or in the other now let's talk much on international law certain international organizations such as the united nations companies and sometimes individuals for example in the area of human rights may have rights or duties under international law international law is the system of law regulating the relations between sovereign states and the rights and duties they have with regard to each other international law deals with matters such as the formation and recognition of states acquisition of territory war uh, the law of the sea and of space treaties treatment of aliens human rights international crimes and international juris judicial settlement of disputes okay when you're talking of aliens these are just foreigners what are the sources of international law sources of international law are public that is treaties custom and general legal principle and private that is a nation's own national laws which regulate international dealings for example the european union is a collection of nations which have agreed between them on some common laws by signing conventions and treaties this is public international law the term private international law is the part of a nation's own law that establishes rules for dealing with cases involving a foreign element legal systems very few law laws are available for international law and as already highlighted as already highlighted in many countries laws are normally national laws although sharing some common methodologies with those of other nations yet certain laws in certain countries have been considered model laws which have influenced the craft of laws in other countries this is where you see uh, for example laws which have been crafted in south africa uh, influencing the crafting of laws in zimbabwe or vice versa it simply means that when a, a law has been found to be a model in another country uh, other countries might be tempted or might end up um, crafting a law that is almost the same as that in another country there are three key legal systems or underlying methodologies of law operating in the world that have been adopted by different countries for different reasons these are common law civil law and sharia law let us talk more about these um civil law 
This is sometimes called private law. It has the aim of settling disputes between individuals. When we are saying individuals, we also mean companies, body corporates. No concept of punishment. Objective is to compensate the wronged party. There is need to prove on the balance of probabilities. And when you are talking of balance of probabilities, we are simply mean that, uh, I mean, we simply mean that the evidence that is required should be reasonable evidence, but not to an extent of uh, proving the fact beyond reasonable doubt, as in criminal cases. Okay, so the evidence should just be considered reasonable. All right. So on the balance of probabilities. All right. This law can be sued in court. If liable, then compensation is payable. The plaintiff and defendant exist in this particular law. There is one part called the plaintiff, that is the complainant, and the defendant, that is the alleged wrongdoer. Personal action brought by the aggrieved party is considered. So there is personal action which is brought by the aggrieved party. We are going to see the police, uh, I mean, initiating the action. But we are seeing that person who is aggrieved to be the one who is going to bring the, 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 the action to court. The court may award the damages or an equitable remedy in damages where appropriate. Then uh, there is what is called common law. Common law systems developed in England but have been exported to many ex-British empires and Commonwealth countries, notably for our purposes, the United States of America. They were developed effective from 1066, which is a very long time ago. The king's representatives attended local courts and then met in London on a regular basis to discuss. About a period of 200 years, the law was commonized, hence common law. The cornerstone of common law is judicial precedent. Ratio decidenti and obe, obita dicta are the most common principles. With commonization came recognition of deficiencies, highlighted, uh, which highlighted the need for alternative remedies, which are called equity. Common law remedy is uh, damages. That is a monetary award. Common law courts were separate from court of equity until the late 19th century. Then uh, there is what is called Sharia law. Sharia law is significantly different from both common and civil law systems. It is a legal system bound up in the religion of Islam which makes it different in both purpose and practice. It has, influ it has influence in many Islamic countries worldwide. Uh, when you're talking of Islam, Islamic countries, we're talking of the UAE, the Pakistan, uh, all those countries in Asia, okay? The Abu Dhabis, okay? Or in, um, the other countries there, the uh, Palestine, uh, all those, they are Islamic countries mostly. Okay? Alright, so uh, it has been adapted as a comprehensive legal system in some of those countries. Okay, this Sharia law. Okay, so wh what is Sharia? Uh, I mean, what does the word Sharia mean? Okay. In essence, it simply means a way to water a place. Right? That's the meaning of the word in uh, uh, in Arabic. Okay. So there is what is called a Quran or Quran. This is the primary source 
of Sharia law. So there is a book called Quran. There's also what is called the Sunnah. The Sunnah. This is what has come to be accepted conduct. An accepted conduct. Then Shia, Hanafi, Maliki, Hanab Hanabali, uh, Shafi. All right. These are the five schools of law. They provide further details or interpretation of acceptable conduct and application of the law. A Sharia judge may refer to these secondary schools to determine how to apply the law. There is another term called Ejitadi. These are the methods of interpreting the law. Then Taklid. This is the belief that no further interpretation is required. Ijma, that is one of two methods of interpretation open to a judge who is not a follower of the taklid thinking. Uh, I mean, who, who is not a follower of the taklid thinking. Ijma is a consensus of opinion of legal scholars or judges. What about kias? This is the Sharia equivalent of judicial precedent. It involves the comparison of two similar situations and the application of accepted law in the first situation to the second. Now, let's move on to equity law. This grew from the recognition of deficiencies of common law. If a monetary award of damages was not appropriate, there was nothing else to offer. In 14 in 14th century, Aectus, uh, can Chancellor's Court, uh, early 7th century, U of Oxford's case, equity shall prevail. Confirmed by 1873 to 1875 uh, Judicature Acts, the main remedies in those acts were, I mean, remedies associated with equity law. There should be specific performance, that is, uh, the actual um, claim should be uh, fulfilled, okay? The wrongdoer should, uh, should appease the aggrieved party with the actual uh, amount that is required or that is being claimed. There should be an injunction, okay? Now, okay, um, I was actually answering a uh, I mean, a phone here. All right, um, I was saying that uh, the the main remedies uh, which have come up, which which have come out of equity law, or which have be, which have been brought about by equity law. Are four that is specific performance, in, injunction, rescission, and uh, rectification. And I say that um, specific performance uh, is when uh, the aggrieved part has to be given uh, those items or um, those things which were being promised in the contract, the actual items which uh, the other part had promised to fulfill for example if we had entered into a contract and somebody uh, was supposed to deliver us two tons of maize and he fails we go to court and claim uh, the actual performance that is the, uh, the delivery of the two tons of maize uh, specific performance is actually uh, the best way to go about if uh, a monetary payment is not going to relieve us of the pain for example we cannot eat money if we want maize as uh, the actual remedy we want then any payment whatsoever amount is not going to help us because we're not going to eat money so we need maize something like that so this is where uh, the equity law comes 
buy with this particular remit of specific performance then injection injection is a is a term used where um the courts using i mean use their power to prevent uh another party from um uh, i mean usually it it comes in to stand or, or to cover uh the wrongdoer or to stop the wrongdoer to um to attend to the demands of the plaintiff okay for example the wrongdoer was being pursued by the plaintiff uh to deliver the maze however the courts have looked into other um circumstances surrounding the wrongdoer maybe they'd failed to deliver the maze because of a cyclone that had occurred in their area which had uh, disrupted the supply chains so in that case forcing this uh, this other party to deliver maize under a cyclone or under a under such a situation is not going to uh, i mean to be you know uh, something acceptable ethically uh, something like that so uh the courts will intervene so they will put an in uh, i mean an injunction okay the something like an interdict okay so, uh, some action they, they they will give an order to stop uh the performance of the obligation they will say no you you need to wait until such a time so that you pay this other guy that's an injunction okay then a rescission this is a cancellation a to rescind is to cancel okay sometimes the court will say no the contract is void uh, at start okay it, 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 the, the contract was wrong it cannot be enforced at law so therefore the court might cancel so it is a, an issue of canceling the contract then rectification rectification is a situation where uh, a wrong a wrongdoing is made correct or is uh, i mean is an issue of making corrections to rectify to make to make good for example um we might have uh, uh, been supplying the two tons of maize however the the recipient or the plaintiff then he determined that the maize was um rotten okay or it, uh, its life some uh, its lifespan had expired so in that case they might cause the the wrongdoer to rectify the situation by supplying uh the maize within um a consumable lifespan okay some uh, i mean some fresh maize something like that so uh, uh, the process of bringing good maize is what is called rectification okay that's rectification all right um let's proceed now the remedies are given at the court's discretion only given if damages are inappropriate okay so uh where the damages are inappropriate then the courts might determine to either give an order for specific performance an injunction rescission and then rectification now let's talk of criminal law this is also called public law okay remember civil law was called private law in criminal law a wrongdoer would have broken the law the wrong was done to the state or the society this is prosecuted in a court so any violation of criminal law is prosecuted in court the the judgment okay or the penalty could uh include could include community service a fine or an imprisonment there is what is called a prosecutor and an accused person there is need to prove beyond reasonable doubt so this is a, a higher level of proof okay it's different from the balance of probabilities which is 
uh, the standard of proof in criminal, uh, I mean, in civil cases. In criminal uh, cases, the uh, the state or the prosecutor has to prove his case beyond reasonable doubt. The police decide whether to prosecute. Yeah, uh, internationally, that's the standard. The police will decide whether to prosecute. This decision is reviewed by the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK. If it is in the UK, then it is the Crown Prosecution Service who have to decide. But in Zimbabwe, obviously the attorney, um, uh, I mean the prosecutor general has to uh, review that decision. Sometimes the police might just dilly-dally a case and you know the prosecutor general would be interested would would intervene to say hey why is this court not i mean why is this case not brought to court now uh the distinction between civil and criminal case now it is not an act or event which creates the distinction between criminal and civil cases but the legal consequences a single event might give rise to criminal and civil proceeding for example a broken leg caused to a pedestrian by a drunken driver is a single event which may give rise to number one a criminal case that is prosecution by the state for the offense of driving with excess alcohol and two a civil case the pedestrian sues the comp I mean for compensation for pain and suffering. The two sorts of proceedings are usually easily distinguished because three vital factors are different. Number one, the court where the case is had, the procedures and the terminology. Okay, so those are the issues we talked of two important legal concepts uh, or jargon there was ratio decidenti and obita dicta ratio decidenti <clears throat> ratio decident, uh is i mean the reason for the decision the ratio or reason is binding on future judges in similar cases now let's talk of reversing higher courts i mean higher court a higher court reverses lower court's decision in in same case what about overruling a higher court overrules lower court's decision in different case so a similar case can have its decision reversed if being handled by a higher court but a different case can be overruled okay by a higher court okay so the decision of a lower court can be overruled in a different case now let's distinguish court avoids earlier precedent by distinguishing the facts ratio not binding if too obscure that is if it is not clear ratio not binding if made without care that is the pair uh, in curia maybe the lower court was not observing certain facts ratio <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> a ratio not binding if in conflict with a basic principle of law sometimes the facts might be so glaring that a certain particular law is being overridden then the the, 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 the decision of the court is not going to bind ratio not binding um, if too wide <clears throat> if too wide sometimes uh, the the ratio or the reason was so uh, was not clearly targeting a particular situation. It was too open, which means it is not going to be binding. 
the ratio might also fail to bind if it conflicts with European law. Remember, we are doing global law and the European law is the standard law for this paper. Ratio not binding if made in inferior court. So if an inferior court made that decision, then an upper court might not be uh, bound to follow such decisions. What about the orbiter dicta principle? Other things that were said, other rules that were stated, but which were not the reasons for the decisions. Obda Dicta is not capable of forming binding precedent, but may be persuasive. Okay, so an Obda Dicta is uh, those other issues which were discussed or which were said in a particular case, but it's not a, a, a ratio dissident or the reason for the decision which was taken by the court. Okay, now, what are the merits and demerits of a judicial precedent? The merits, consistency, certainty, and clarity promote predictability. Once we know that this, uh, when, a uh, when a similar event occurred some, uh, in some other cases uh, a long time ago, this was the decision. So, since we now know the decision, when a similar case occurs, we are in a better position to predict the outcome of the case. That's the merit of a judicial precedent. It gives some predictability or some clarity. There is flexibility. It allows development to meet the changing needs of society. The principle of judicial precedent has got some flexibility in it. It is practical as it arises from actual events which took place. What about the demerits? A vast number of cases leads to bulk complexity and inconsistency. So it has been found that uh, in the majority of cases, this principle leads to bulk complexity and inconsistency in the application of the law. There is also rigidity because courts are forced to just follow what occurred in previous cases and then apply in this other case, which might not, you know, each case, I mean, cases are unique, they are different if you look at them. So you, if we simply apply or force courts to follow a certain decision, that might be a rigidity. Patchwork nature means that Case law is reactive rather than proactive. So uh, those are the demerits of judicial precedent. Now let's talk of separation of powers and the rule of law. Okay, separation of power, in short, is uh, uh, a situation where uh, the state... Um, Okay, where within a, a jurisdiction, uh, the major, I mean, uh, state organs are, are separated. Okay, that is, it is the process of making laws uh, separated in three distinct areas. That is the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. When you are talking of the legislature, this is an elected body which decides which laws need to be passed to, sat to satisfy the nation's wishes, for example, health and defense. Then the executive. This is an elected body which makes the decisions which put the law into action. For example, in the UK, the elected government. Then the judiciary. This is a non-elected body which rules on disputes about law. These disputes may be between government and individuals, that is criminal law, or between individuals and individuals, that is civil law.
okay? Now let's look at the effects of economics and political systems on legal systems. Business activity takes place within a particular economic, political, and legal context. And each of these areas will affect uh, each other, on, I mean, to an extent. The economic and political context of each nation is not the same, although many groups of nations are similar, and therefore nations' legal systems vary considerably from one another. The differences between the nations in terms of economic, politics, and most importantly for this syllabus law can present problems for international trade. In this course, we shall explore difficulties presented and the solutions created by various international bodies, particularly the United Nations, which we introduce in the next week. Economic systems. Economics can be described as the ways in which society decides what to produce, how to produce it, and who to produce it for. Basically, every individual is involved in economics, in providing uh, goods or services, okay, even labor for himself and his family. On a wider scale, governments are involved in economics for the whole country. There are three basic kinds of economic systems, the blind, market, and mixed economies. What is a planned economy? Here, allocation of resources is determined centrally by government. Prices are fixed centrally for both resources and production. Prices are not therefore the result of the forces of supply and demand. Individuals own items of personal property but real wealth is held by the central government or regional government. What about market economy? In this economy, allocation of resources is determined by the forces of supply and demand. Market forces dictate quantity of production and consumption. Price is dependent upon the supply and demand. Wealth is held individually rather than collectively. Fundamentally, a market economy exists where the decisions and choices about resource allocation are left to market forces of supply and demand and the workings of the price mechanism. What about mixed economy? Here, decisions and choices are made partly by free market forces of supply and demand and partly by government decisions. Economic wealth is divided between the private sector and the public sector. In reality, all modern national economies are mixed economies although with the differing proportions of free market and centrally planned decision-making from one country to the next. Now, let's do the assignments. Okay, I hope you have been uh, helped with this um, audio presentation and I hope you are going to attempt your uh, first week's assignment. Remember, our pass mark is 80%. So you need to attempt, I mean, to replay this audio um, time and again, okay? Until you have mastered the concepts. Until next time, may the good Lord continue to bless you.